Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is an industry update on M&A. Why buy? Tips for those with their sights set on becoming an acquirer. It's a conversation with my partner, Lewis Diamond. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. For Apple Podcast users, I'd be grateful if you'd give the show a review. Your input helps us to make the series better and alerts other advisors like you who may find the content to be relevant. And while you're at it, if you know others who are considering change or simply looking to learn more about the industry landscape, please feel free to share this episode or the series widely. M&A has been one of the hottest topics in the wealth management industry in recent years. And even despite choppy markets and rising interest rates, independent firms are getting high watermark valuations and deals are closing at record levels. So what's driving all this activity? Why are independent business owners so eager to sell what they worked long and hard to build and nurture? What's the attraction for buyers? And how can a nascent firm or wirehouse advisor planning for their next chapter set themselves up to be a successful acquirer? We talked in previous episodes about being on the seller's side. In this episode, we turn the tables for the buy side perspective. Because the truth of the matter is that there's an imbalance in the industry between those who want to sell and those who want to buy. There's an incredible appetite amongst buyers and not nearly enough sellers to meet the demand. So to become a credible and attractive acquirer amongst some hefty competition, you need to possess certain attributes, which we will definitely get into. I've asked Lewis to join me in answering these questions and more. There's tons to discuss, so let's get to it. Lewis, as always, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Excited to talk about our topic today. You bet. Okay, so let's start with level setting first and foremost before we dive in. What is the current M&A environment in the independent space? So not surprisingly, it remains a really, really fertile market, even with the rising interest rates and the market turbulence. There's more demand than ever before from private equity-backed acquirers, private equity firms in general. And overall, it's still a fractured industry. So still a lot of room to run as far as the number of M&A transactions. If you look at any industry report, whether through Fidelity or Echelon Partners, or DeVoe, all all of them put out various reports. Um, Seems like every quarter there's a new record being notched as far as number of transactions. And just looking at the median-sized deals, that keeps ticking up. So it's a very active market with there being a ton of dry powder um, in the market and a lot of folks looking to do deals and still a lot of folks looking to sell, even in spite of, of the market gyrations. And so on the other side of the table, why are independent business owners anxious to sell? Yeah, it's probably four or five different things. Um, I think the first one is we've seen a massive run up in valuations. So the multiples that acquirers are putting on businesses has never been greater. Um, The last couple of years, we've probably seen a 30 to 40 percent, maybe even higher increase in, in valuation multiples. And that's because of this imbalance with supply and demand. The demand for a quality practice far out, outweighs the amount of supply. So we're seeing a number of firms come to market because of FOMO, the fear of missing out, wanting to sell their house top of market, seeing what friends have sold for, and wanting to make sure they get a piece of the action. So that's definitely part of it, is opportunistically looking at the market conditions and thinking it's a good time to sell. Another reason is, as the valuation multiples have gone up, it's become prohibitively expensive for next generation advisors to buy into practices. So more times than not, a firm will want to do an internal succession plan, meaning selling to 
loyal employees and next generation folks, it's easier, it's more seamless, and you get to reward those who have helped you kind of build the business over the years. But with the market environment right now, it's become so expensive for these folks to buy into the practice that either the buyer needs to take a ton of debt and really put their financial future in jeopardy, or the seller, meaning the retiring advisor, has to take a big discount to fair market value. So more times than not, then, even if there is a strong next generation, we're seeing it that a business has to be taken to market and to be sold externally, or to at least bring in an outside capital source to finance or take a piece of the equity. A third reason is succession. Nothing new here. Advisors looking for succession plans, not being enough younger folks in the business. And usually a succession event is one of the primary motivations someone has to sell. And I'll give you just two more real quick. Many firms lack scale, especially as some of these larger firms keep getting larger and larger. The resources and capabilities they have keeps getting better. And firms have to decide whether to reinvest in the business, hire a bunch of folks, build new capabilities, et cetera, improve technology, or do they decide to sell? And by selling or merging, they can gain some pretty quick scale. And there's some other ones like not wanting to run the business anymore, kind of being burnt out of running it and wanting to hand over those responsibilities to someone else. And maybe even the desire to add on new services like estate planning or trust services or family office services. There's a lot to unpack there, but two questions come to mind. One is, so you're talking about the multiples being at high watermarks. Do we expect them to continue? We don't have the crystal ball and we're not valuation experts. From what we've seen, it seems like the multiples have stayed relatively consistent and there isn't really an expectation that they're going to keep going up at the same level that they were before. But I think it is interesting that they've kind of normalized and stayed consistent. And I think especially for higher quality firms, so meaning ones that are larger, can grow organically, have a strong next generation, et cetera, there's going to continue to be a lot of demand for those firms. And as we'll get into There's a lot more buyers than sellers of those types of businesses. So I think as long as there continues to be all this interest in buying quality businesses, I think there is some potential room to run. But we did see, like similar to the housing market, that valuations kept going up and up and up. But now with the rising interest rates and some of the stuff that's going on in the stock market, I don't think anyone's expecting them to keep rising at the same level. But also no one's expecting the market to crater either. Yeah. Well, that's good stuff for sellers for sure. But the other question is, you know, just the other day I talked to the owner of a billion dollar firm and he said he's growing at 30% per year. They're crushing it. Loves what he does. Built a successful RIA firm after having come from a traditional brokerage firm many years ago. And while he talked about the fact that it is very frustrating that he's unable to add staff and hence he has a capacity issue He's really committed to hiring and growing as opposed to selling or merging. And so while there are plenty of sellers that have FOMO and want in on this sort of hoopla of a market, there are many who really want to retain full control. What do you think about that? I think that's absolutely a business owner's prerogative. And the big thing you give up when you sell the business is control. The good thing is right now, There's so many different acquisition models out there where advisors can keep varying levels of control. So maybe someone looks to sell a minority piece of the business and still keeps their brand and their infrastructure, et cetera. On the other end of the spectrum would be a full-on acquisition where a large-scale RIA buys a smaller one, and then it's a full integration where brand and investment process and everything is morphed into the buyers. So definitely that's something that someone has to reconcile with is how much control am I willing to give up and how important is it for me to solve for whatever the gap is? So in the case of the gentleman you spoke with, my guess is either he was more focused on growth and didn't have any glaring strategic holes to fill or said, I can kind of be the buyer instead of the seller. And for right now, at least, I think I still have some growth left in me and I'd rather retain control over taking chips off the table or gaining scale or solving for any of the other reasons that I mentioned that people might look to sell. Yeah. So I I think we're going to get to it, but the notion of, so how likely is he to become a successful buyer at a billion dollars, completely self-funded, not backed by any source of client or institutional capital. But the other thing I think is really what I said to him is you have only just decided 
that you need to add to your infrastructure, that you need to add staff. So give it a couple of years. It's probably not that important. You're not in that much pain. It's not terrible. Right now, you're still growing at 30% per year. So there's no real motivation to sell. But if after a few years in a very competitive market, you haven't had success in acquiring or buying or recruiting, you may change your tune. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I completely agree. And look, if he's growing at 30% per year, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, why would I sell now when I can be double or triple my size in three to five years? And I think as long as he can sustain that growth rate and the client service model doesn't deteriorate, he's still able to have work-life balance and whatever's important to him. I think it's, he's probably right to not sell as long as he can keep up that growth rate responsibly. I agree with that totally. And that's what I said to him. I think that we say a lot of times to advisors, you shouldn't move until or unless the pain of staying is great enough. He doesn't have pain. Yeah, he wants to grow. He's beginning to sort of recognize a capacity issue. But when you're growing at 30% per year, it's hard to argue with that. But again, I think we're going to get back to it a little later. But let me ask you right now, how likely is it that this gentleman's firm with the billion under management becomes the next major acquirer? Yeah. I mean, to me, if I had to handicap it, I would say it's it's going to be tough because in this environment, unless you're backed by major institutional capital or have a really strong balance sheet and you've already locked in low borrowing costs, it's hard to compete against these major, major players. By last count, there's over 30 different private equity firms that have made a platform investment in the wealth management industry, meaning they've backed a firm or a platform that they're then weaponizing to go out and acquire practices. So you have all those types of firms that are competing on a national basis. You have local ones that may have access to capital, et cetera. So his ability to execute on his M&A strategy, to me, the most likely outcome is he hits a couple singles and doubles here and there, maybe he does a deal or two, which might be impactful. But to say that he's going to automatically become the next major buyer, I think that's, that's hard because it takes a lot more than just one firm with an interest in buying to go out and be successful. And I think that's what we're going to spend a lot of this talking about is if you are this type of firm, what can you do to set yourself apart? And what do you need to think about in order to have a shot at competing with the big boys? Yep. Okay. So great pivot point. So who are firms, whether it be this billion dollar firm or firms of any size, who are the buyers? Who are they selling to? So same answer. Who are the buyers? Who are the sellers? It could be other RIAs. So it could be a local firm or more of a regional player. could be any, really any size, but it would be a firm that shares a common culture that believes that one plus one equals three. Typically these firms are not backed by, by major pools of capital. They're independent and fully owned by, by by the leadership team. That's definitely a major part of the market. I think as we've seen, the number of non-private equity-backed RIAs that are buying, their share of acquisitions keeps going down and down in favor of these larger private equity-backed firms. But that's still a viable category. Another buyer might be, call them a national acquirer. So this would be one of these 30 plus firms that are backed by private equity or family office money or some sort of institutional capital that has scale, has a platform that they figured out growth. And it's one that they believe is attractive enough to lure in multiple firms. And usually these these practices are spread out across the country. They're agnostic as to geography, but they're going to be full integration models, meaning someone joining them gives up their brand, gives up full autonomy on the investment side, plugs into their planning process, and really the acquirer's method of doing everything. Other buyers might be a private equity firm or a family office. These are these are groups that might buy a majority of the business. They might buy a minority slug of it as well. And usually there's some sort of strategic benefit outside the capital that these groups bring, whether it's M&A expertise or deal sourcing or strategic guidance. And these are definitely a very popular part of the market. And then we'll say the rest are strategic acquirers. So it could be an insurance company that's looking for distribution or just likes the industry and wants to diversify the revenue stream. It could be a bank, kind of folks swinging back the other way. Maybe they broke away from a major firm at one point, but now banks definitely want back in the space. We've seen a number of bank deals. And then even asset managers. As asset management is under challenge, a lot of asset managers, they like the fact that fees haven't compressed in the wealth management space. They like the recurring revenue. 
and they liked some of the synergies with what they're building. So point is, lots and lots and lots of buyers and a lot of different types of sellers too. It seems like if you're a seller, it's like drinking from a fire hose. How do you differentiate between them? And again, this is an episode about buyers, but if you are a seller or thinking about selling or essentially a nascent firm or thinking about going independent and thinking about building something with the end in mind, how do you differentiate who you might sell to? Yeah, it's hard. So we like to help business owners and advisors kind of bucket these different buyers into categories, and each one has their pros and cons. So it starts with, what are you looking to accomplish? How much control are you looking to keep? What are the major gaps you're looking to solve for? And usually we like to begin with that, kind of walk before you run, before taking meetings or running a full process. You really got to understand what's a non-negotiable, what's a red line item for you, And what's the major things you're looking to accomplish? And then that helps to kind of differentiate, but it is hard. And that's why it's usually advisable that a seller who's going to sell their business once works with some sort of professional, whether it's a consultant or investment banker, a business broker, or someone who's done this before and can add some institutional credibility to your own process. All right, so let's pivot to what people came for, the notion of the buyer. So this may seem like a naive question, but why would a firm even be interested in acquiring? Yeah, it's a great question. This is the one where it seems like a no-brainer. Everyone says they want to acquire because it seems like it's a, it's a complete no-brainer. But I think there's probably five or six really good reasons. And maybe we'll, we'll flip back and forth on what the reasons are. But I think the first point is, it's not really a reason, but it's more a disclaimer that not every firm should be interested in buying because being an acquirer is a ridiculous amount of work. The dating process takes forever. You have to kiss a lot of frogs before you, before you find your prince. Integration is a massive amount of work. The deal process could be a slog. So if you're not really committed to being a buyer, I would say be out. It's either be all in or be all out. That's the first disclaimer I'll give is just, just because it might be attractive doesn't mean that it's the right thing for you to do because you really have to be committed to it and have a strategic plan on how you're going to accomplish it. So I would say, I'll take the next one, the notion of operating leverage, that the more a firm adds to its bottom line without increasing expenses, the more the firms expand margins and increase operating leverage. It's why a lot of folks are so interested in going independent in the first place. Because if you're an employee advisor of UBS, UBS owns all of your operating leverage as you grow. But when you go independent, you begin to own the operating leverage. So the notion of adding additional advisors or recruiting or acquiring other firms, you are automatically increasing operating leverage without necessarily concomitantly increasing expenses. Yep, exactly. So your EBOC might be 60 to 65% of, of revenue before you do a deal, but after you do a deal and you add a million, two million, three million of revenue, to your point, without adding expenses necessarily, maybe your, your EBOC increases to 65 to 70% then all of a sudden there's more free cash flow and the combined business is worth a lot more than the standalone business. So I think that's exactly right. That's an elegant way of putting, of kind of explaining the the financial benefits of M&A. The next one I would give is new talent. A lot of firms look at M&A, of course there's financial benefits, but they look at acquisitions as being a talent grab. It's really hard to find good people. So by acquiring businesses, you're able to bring in next generation advisors or bring in folks that have a different discipline or a different focus and really help the combined firm be even better. And especially in a tight labor market, this is one of the more appealing aspects of acquiring a company. Mm-hmm. Well, and the next one is actually very similar, the notion of expanding services or areas of focus. So if you're a firm that services mass affluent clients and you acquire a firm that offers a family office type or concierge services or deals with more high net worth clients or that offers insurance services or bringing in someone who does accounting and tax prep. It's the notion of increasing your opportunities for success. Yep, exactly right. So looking at each acquisition as being a way to expand capabilities. And there's a number of acquirers in the market who won't even consider a deal unless the, unless the target does something differently. And there's areas that they can pick off from the acquired firm 
that's going to make the combined firm even better. Yeah, but I have to imagine, Lewis, that there is a downside to that, that if that saying stick to your knitting. So if your knitting is serving one type of client and now you go out and look to only do a deal or acquire a firm that does something completely different than you do, isn't there a high chance for failure? Yeah, I don't disagree. There has to be a balance, right? I mean, if there, I don't think there would be enough benefits for either firm if they're two completely different businesses. But maybe they're both planning-based firms. One has a focus on working with doctors. The other one comes in and they have a focus on working with corporate executives. Maybe there are some cross synergies between the planning resources and the investment, the investment platform. And now it's, okay, we're really good at marketing to this one audience. You, you market to this other audience. We can use our joint capabilities to go and expand our market share in both markets. So I think it's all about the, the balance or kind of the give and take of the two. Yeah, well, and I think that speaks to 100% of what underlies everything we're going to talk about, where acquiring is great, it increases revenue and operating leverage and all that sort of good stuff, but the wrong deal can blow up a firm and culture matters. Exactly right. And the the last two I'll round us out on is is entering a new geographic market. This one's self-explanatory. So it's, okay, we're based in Chicago and we're also in Indiana. We want to acquire a firm that's in New York or that's in Philadelphia and use an acquisition as a way to enter a new market. And then maybe even extend it further and say, we're going to enter a new market and then we're going to do a sub-acquisition strategy in that market as well. So basically having a beachhead to go out and do more deals in a different geographic area. Much easier to kind of acquire a large share of assets in a, in a new geographic market rather than trying to go and build client by client in a market that you don't have brand credibility and you don't have centers of influence. And the last one, and this one goes hand in hand with operating leverage, is the concept of a rising tide lifting all boats. So let's say my independent firm is worth nine to 10 times earnings or EBITDA before I do an acquisition. I then go and acquire a firm for six times EBITDA. The combined firm now might be worth 12 times EBITDA. So very quickly, obviously you have the work of integrating the firms, the combined entity is worth a whole lot more. So this might talk to firms that offer equity as part of a deal where it makes sense if I'm at 6x, you're at 10x, why don't we come together and now be worth 12x? And when the combined firm goes to sell, it's now worth a whole lot more. So lots and lots of financial benefits of acquiring. And we talked about, I think, some of the softer benefits on talent acquisition, expanding services, and entering new markets. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to pivot now. So if I'm a team at a traditional brokerage firm, Morgan, Merrill, UBS, name it, any regional firm on the street, how is acquiring in the independent space different than being a successor via a retiring advisor program like Merrill CTP or UBS's Alpha or Morgan Stanley's FAP? Yeah, I think it's a really, really fair question. When we speak with advisors that are captive at a wirehouse or really any traditional W-2 firm, they do have a big opportunity to serve as the successor to an advisor that's looking to retire. And all of these major firms and even smaller ones have come up with buyout mechanisms where a retiring advisor can monetize their life's work for a relatively fair multiple. And the next generation advisor is then able to pay them out from the cash flow of the business and ultimately have a much larger pool of assets that they'll manage in the future. So it is a very appealing aspect of being at a big firm and that you do have kind of a, a captive a captive group of folks to acquire. Unlike in the RIA channel where there's a multitude of buyers and it could be any really any firm across the industry could buy, the appealing aspect of being an acquirer in a W-2 model is an advisor is likely to sell to someone within their branch office or within their market and certainly within their firm. So you have less competition and likely have a clearer path to being a successful acquirer. That said, it's not all positive because someone who's acquiring a business, and I have air quotes up, in a W-2 model is not really acquiring anything. What they're doing is they're using their own sweat equity to, I guess, transfer economics from the retiring advisor to them after a period of a lower payout. But in the end, their firm is still legally owning the book of business. So really, it's putting in the blood, sweat, and tears to transfer a business. But in the end, you're not owning anything. And this is compared to being independent, where advisors own their business, own their equity, own the client relationships, and every firm they acquire, they're legally owning and have the ability to sell it 
for much higher multiple in the future. So I think that's the first one. Is there anything you would you would add there? No, I think that that's absolutely right. It depends upon what your goal is. If I'm an advisor at Merrill Lynch and I intend to retire and I am perfectly satisfied that Merrill Lynch is the right legacy for me, it's perfect for my clients, it allows me to do everything I need to do, and either I don't have a next-gen successor or my next-gen successor is equally satisfied as I am, then these retire-in-place programs at the traditional firms are actually a gift. The problem is, and I know you and I talk about this all the time, that probably the number one constituency we hear from are next-gen advisors that call us and say, a partner advisor who is 60 or 70 wants to retire. It's a gift that I can inherit a billion-dollar book or $500 million book, but what are the downsides? And you and I, we've done episodes, we've written a lot, we've interviewed Tom Lewis, an attorney, talking about the topic. There are plenty of downsides. So I think that's, I don't want to belabor the point, but what you said about the fact that in those retire in place programs, the younger advisor is actually buying a business that he or she doesn't own in the end. Yeah. But exactly the next right. thing is the notion of gaining more flexibility and creativity in terms of structure. So maybe you can give us some examples of what we mean by that, Lewis. Sure. So with any of these kind of prepackaged retire in place programs, there's sometimes different options that advisors have for, for entering into the programs. They can choose sometimes when they enter it and ultimately how many years one get paid out over but it's pretty formulaic. It basically says, if you're doing this much in business, you've been at the firm this long, then here's what you, it's easier to understand. It takes away a lot of the negotiation that's necessary between buyer and seller, but it does box both buyer and seller into a prepackaged approach versus in the independent space, there's limitless options for how to structure a deal. So maybe a seller wants to stay on for 10 years. So maybe they can sell 10% 10% a year for 10 years, or maybe they're really focused on selling the business for the highest number, and they think their business is worth way more than what a retire in place program is worth. So they're welcome to go take it to market, sell it for whatever they want. And same thing with the buyer. They can structure deals in different ways. They can use equity as a currency. They can change the duration of how long they're going to pay someone out over. There's just a lot of different ways that both buyers and sellers, I think, can meet their joint goals versus being locked into kind of a preset approach, which is what happens in these retire in place programs that are part of the W-2 world. Yeah. And I think if you are a next gen successor and young enough with a long enough runway to retirement, there's a whole lot to gain to be building a business over time that eventually can sell for a multiple anywhere from nine to say 15x. Right. Exactly right. And that's right. So because you're actually owning the business, if you're buying in the as an independent, then you're able to go and sell the business for more because you actually own the business. And like we talked about before with operating leverage being a really important term, if I'm buying a business, let's say I'm a advisor at Merrill who's buying a retiring advisor's book, regardless of the size of that book, maybe I'm doing $2 million of annual revenue, I buy another $2 million book, maybe I was at a 48% payout before I did the deal. Now, once I buy, maybe I'm getting a 49% payout or 48.5%. So now my business is significantly more profitable to the firm, but I'm not increasing my net payout as opposed to the independent world where, of course, you have to take into account the cost of debt and you have to actually pay someone for the business. But maybe I'm at 65%. Now, after the deal, I'm at 70% because now I control the operating leverage versus my firm. Yeah, I think that's a big one. So I want to get to what an advisor or a team who goes independent needs to do to establish themselves as a buyer, because I think that that's really the key to this episode. But before we get there, maybe we can talk about some examples of ex-wirehouse teams who have been successful acquirers. Sure. I'll actually just give three examples just from this podcast. So these are advisors that we've interviewed on this series. So anyone who's listening can check out those episodes. We'll put the links in the, on the episode page. So there's a ton more, but I was using just the universe of folks that have been gracious enough to come on our show. So one that's very top of mind, it was actually the, an episode that will be very close in release to this one, is Todd Resnick, who runs 17. 
Todd and his team were managing about 600 million before they left Morgan Stanley. This was back in, in 2016. Today, they're about 2.8 billion. And much of that growth has come through M&A. They've sold a portion of the business to a family office. They've done a couple of notable acquisitions. And they've also been a very successful recruiter of top talent. So they're a really good example of a team that grew. They've grown organically, but much of their growth to 2.8 billion has been inorganic. So Todd's a great example. Another one would be Jerry Goldberg. His firm was GYL Financial Synergies. They were a Wells Fargo advisors group that moved over to Wells Fargo Finet. And then a couple of years ago, they launched into the independent space, partnering with Focus Financial Partners, and then have done a number of deals and have more than quadrupled the business, largely through M&A. And Focus is a great example of an enabler of acquisitions, where they're the institutional capital, they're providing deal-making expertise. And obviously, Jerry and his team have to be doing something pretty special to convince others to entrust their life's work to them. But Focus is kind of the catalyst or the enabler of that. And then another one I'll give you, this one's a little bit different, but it's definitely an M&A strategy, would be Rob Seachin, who is running New Edge Wealth as part of Edgeco. They're backed by Parthenon Capital. Rob left UBS managing about $5 billion in assets. And now, in less than two years, they've acquired the practices of some very significant wirehouse teams that have broken away and are very serious about acquiring RIAs. So that's three examples. They're all playing in different segments of the market. They have different capital partners. But I think what all of them have in common was a vision of doing something that they couldn't do at their current firm. They've all partnered with capital providers and those that can provide expertise and capital. And they also had really compelling value propositions where they knew what they were doing was, was a great model for attracting clients, but they were able to then go out and make that appealing to a broader audience. So I think all three of those are really good roadmaps or examples or case studies of how these successful wirehouse teams became even more successful after going independent and turning to m and I love that. So there were so many things that stick out to me about those examples. And I love the interviews we did with each of the three owners that you mentioned. But the thing that sticks out more than anything is that all three of them sold either all or part of their firm to some form of institutional capital. So when I asked before about that billion-dollar firm, the owner of the billion-dollar firm who wants to grow by acquisition, and I said, how likely is it that he will be successful? And you said sort of low probability. Is that because one of the ingredients in order, one of the key ingredients to really establish yourself as a buyer is to take on some sort of capital pool? I think the short answer is yes. That is one of the hacks to becoming a successful acquirer is aligning yourself with some sort of capital partner for a couple of reasons. I think one is it's a really expensive endeavor to go out and acquire and just relying upon your own cash flow or turning to a bank for debt financing doesn't really get it done. You kind of need that extra bit of firepower. It's also really hard to complete deals. So having access to groups that can structure deals, they have deal documents, they can do valuations, they can run a process is extremely helpful. It also just puts you on the radar of folks like us, of investment bankers, and other other deal facilitators in the industry, because we take much more seriously a firm that's backed by a credible capital source. So it's not the only way to become a buyer. And there's a couple of buyers I can think of who purposely haven't taken on capital, but I think they're in the minority. And over time, they probably struggle to keep up with what these larger firms can do. I actually think that you're right. And yet someone like this gentleman that called me the other day is hell bent on spending the next five years really looking to add talent. So what are some of the other things that a buyer of any size who either is or isn't backed by institutional capital or significant capital, what is it that they need to do in order to establish themselves as a buyer? Yeah. So I think it first and foremost starts with what makes your firm different from everyone else? It's the old joke if you're at an industry conference at an M&A session and someone asks, who's looking to buy? 87% of the room puts their hand up. Who's looking to sell? Maybe one guy puts his hand up. And then a couple of people are too shy to answer. So that is kind of the dynamic. So you really do have to go out of your way to stand out from every other firm, not just locally, but across the country. So it's what makes your firm different and unique. 
if you can't articulate that in a very clear and concise way, away from kind of the, say the table stakes, we have great people, we have a really good brand, we care about our clients, we focus on planning, you probably shouldn't attempt m a So you have to just think long and hard about what makes your firm different and unique, not just to an end client, but to a prospective advisor or business owner who might want to join you. I think another one is that you've really figured out how to grow organically. So you don't need to rely upon acquisitions to grow. Firms or advisors looking to join you, they're usually attracted to firms that figured out organic growth. So whether it's a, it's a lead generation program or access to a custodian's referral program or CPA referral networks, some sort of way that you can show advisors how they'll be better off financially by joining you and why they can grow faster with you than without you. So I think if you crack the code in organic growth and there's a way to scale what you're doing, that's a really compelling ingredient that you can use as part of your value proposition and stand out versus many others in the field. So you talk about somebody like Todd Resnick going from 600 million to 2.8 billion. So it sounds like the most pivotal thing he did was to sell part of his firm to a family office, right? Yes. I think that was a catalyst. He was successful before, but they recently announced a merger with a billion dollar plus firm. And they announced that at the same time as taking on capital from Merchant, which is a family office. So what you're saying is that Merchant, which was in this case, the source of capital, became the catalyst that gave them the money and the legitimacy to then go out and be attractive to sellers and other wirehouse advisors. Is that right? I think that's right. But I think Todd and his team had figured something out before. It wasn't just that they took on capital and now all of a sudden they're interesting and compelling. They built a really interesting firm. They had a clear message about what they can do for advisors. And they had a track record of proving how they recruited advisors and those advisors were then able to grow faster than they could have grown without them. So it it all kind of goes hand in hand, but we'll say access to capital or selling a piece of the business, it might be the fuel that, that kind of makes the fire spread. And without that, Maybe it's just, it's a controlled burn versus something that can be taken nationwide. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point. So we're saying that all of these sort of really legitimate buyers have one thing in common, and it's that they've taken on some form of capital, but if they didn't have a spectacular and unique value proposition, they didn't have a, an infrastructure, a strong and robust infrastructure with excess capacity. They didn't have systems and support to support it all. And they didn't understand the market. They never would have been successful. I think that's right. And I think another really overlooked piece of being successful at this is having either a dedicated resource or maybe the leader of the firm whose almost entire job is to focus on M&A. It really doesn't work when you have the CEO, who's also an advisor, who also dabbles in M&A. Even though Some people might like that they can empathize with the person they're talking to. It's really a full-time job to do this successfully. So by committing to investing in an M&A business likely means hiring someone or reallocating your time and energy to M&A. And I think that's another piece of it is just you're committing to it. And again, it's all in or all out. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's also worth noting that not everyone who goes independent wants to become a prolific buyer, wants to become the next New Edge or the next One Seven or the next Jerry Goldberg's GYL financial strategies. And that's okay too. But if one's goal is to become a buyer and really build a firm that becomes a prolific acquirer, then a lot of what we're talking about matters. I agree. Yeah. I mean, we hear that a lot of times with teams considering independence is, I don't want to acquire. Why should I go independent? And the answer is there's many other reasons why you should. But for many, the idea of being an acquirer or being a recruiter of talent is one of the major reasons they want to go independent. So every advisor has their own reasons. We're just giving some reasons why it might make sense to buy. But certainly you could be a successful firm without being a buyer. Yeah. And it's worth noting, I know you and I have moved plenty of breakaway advisors, that is advisors leaving the traditional space to go independent, who had zero interest in becoming acquirers out of the gate. But as they began to really understand the notion of operating leverage, and as they began to really get their, plant their feet on the ground and really wrap their head around being a CEO, the notion of acquisition or recruiting became really appealing to them. 
So it's not necessarily somebody's goal right out of the gate, but it oftentimes can be over time. And we've also seen it the other way where advisors try to bite off too much at once, where they're breaking away, they're going to be independent for the first time, and they want to start acquiring or recruiting right away. And that's not normally advisable either. So it, you kind of got to find the right time in the evolution of your business to consider buying, if there's any time at all. Yeah, I agree. So let me ask you one last question. So if someone has now set themselves up as a buyer, how do you go about finding the right potential targets? Yeah, I think the first thing is you have to take it upon yourself. So you can reach out to firms like ours or investment bankers or centers of influence all you want. But if you're really serious about it, you have to take matters into your own hands. So to me, that means either hiring someone who's a full-time deal sourcer and that they may find deals through cold calling or LinkedIn or networking through industry events, many ways to go about it. But I think the first one is don't wait for the phone to ring, go out and make it incumbent upon yourself to go and find targets. That's one. The other one would be to notify key people in the industry, whether it's it's centers of influence that you know interact with with many advisors or firms. It could be your custodian's relationship manager. Again, firms like ours or investment bankers. It could be attorneys, really anyone who traffics with potential targets. Another one I would say is just make yourself known. Be out in the public eye, whether it's being in the media or having a social media presence. You want to be known as a thought leader and be known as someone that Okay, I, if I sold one day, I would like to sell to that person. And the more you're out there and putting out unique content, the better chance you have at standing out. So I think that's a couple of ways that it comes to mind. Yeah. You and I have built a business where putting out smart and thoughtful content, not for the purpose of marketing or selling, but for the purpose because we wanted to put our thought leadership out there and we've grown a lot because of it, we know better than anyone that that really works. So I love that idea. So I think there's a lot to say. Buying can be very attractive. It also can be absolutely detrimental if it's not done the right way or not with the right firm, I should say. So Lewis, I can't thank you enough for joining me, but any sort of closing words of wisdom, if you will? I think the only thing to say is, I mentioned earlier, only approach M&A if you're really ready to commit yourself to it. If you're not, then it's okay to stay on the sidelines. That's really good advice. Essentially, know thyself. Lois, I love doing these episodes with you. I think it's always really a smart back and forth. I thank you so much for joining me. Anytime. Look forward to the next one. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the articles link to browse recent topics. These written pieces are an ideal way of staying informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. You can feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 973-476-8578, which is my cell, or by email mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And keep in mind that our services are available without cost to the advisor. You can see our website for more information. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. If you're listening on the Apple Podcasts app, I'd be grateful if you gave it a store rating and a review. It will let other advisors know it's a show worth their time to listen to. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.